So last week, after the uh, Bible study, somebody came up to me and said that uh, he was a little disappointed. He, he couldn't get in his thoughts about uh, a topic that he wanted to bring up for one of the discussions, which was spiritual warfare. He wanted to talk about that and one of the answers to some of the questions that were asked. And, you know, we jump around from discussion to discussion. And sometimes I'll tell somebody, hold that thought, but I might not come back to that person. So I had that thought in my mind that he, uh, he didn't get to say uh, what his thoughts were on spiritual warfare, but that was in my mind, right? And so since it was in my mind throughout the, uh, throughout the week, I thought I should mention something about it in the sermonette because we'll be seeing a lot of stars, and I think it's, it's appropriate. We'll be gonna, we're going to see a lot of stars in the streets this coming week, right? We're gonna see Donald Trump's. We're gonna see Caitlyn Jenner's. We're gonna see El Chapo's, right? We're gonna see parties, maybe work parties, parties we don't want to attend, but we're gonna see people walking around like the Walking Dead, with flesh hanging around, hanging out, vampire teeth, people, <laughs> people dressed in, as ghouls and demons. We're gonna see Christian houses, right? We're gonna see Christian houses decorated as if they're rotting away with spider webs with skeletons, with tombstones, with ghosts, with spooky jack-o'-lanterns, all in the name of fun. You're gonna have people dressed up in skimpy outfits with their mouse ears and tails. We're gonna see French maids and naughty nurses, right? Maybe the kids are involved. Maybe the kids are dressed up like something from the magic kingdom, where they're a fairy princess with a magic wand or a Harry Potter with his magic wand, or some avenging superhero. So somebody will say, what's wrong with that, Jeff? You're a spoiled sport, you know, fun. <laughs> We're not being disrespectful towards God when we do that. Well, the topic I started saying, this is about spiritual warfare. And so the Beyond Today telecast has a uh, broadcast a series on the internet as well. It's called Kingdoms at War. I don't know if you guys have been watching it or not. But it talks about not just the physical kingdoms on this earth that God has control over and lets come to power, but that there are two principal kingdoms that have always been at war. And they're spiritual kingdoms. So let's go to John 18 and verse 36. John 18 and verse 36. Jesus Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. See, they wouldn't take up physical arms to prevent his death. If they were, I mean, they would take up physical arms to prevent his death if, if they were of this world. However, there were two things that were stopping them from doing that. Number one, they had spiritual insight and spiritual knowledge. Maybe not to the degree, obviously, that Jesus Christ does, because he was the one instructing. But he revealed things to them. And we have those things written down, and so he reveals those things to us as well. So they knew certain things that were revealed directly as chosen apostles, and you all are chosen and called. And number two, even if they didn't have full insight into why he should be taken and crucified, they had the faith to understand that Jesus knew what he was talking about. Okay? So Jesus says, but now my kingdom is not from here. Christ's kingdom is not from here. What about us? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Everybody here is a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And you have to believe that because we are at war, and we'll see that as we read on. And if Christ, if we're a member of his body and his kingdom was not from here, then neither is our kingdom. Neither is our kingdom. If you go to verse 27... It says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 
the member in the members in Christ are the church, his body. Christ is the head of that body, right? He's the head of the body and the king of kings for that kingdom to come. And 1 Colossians 1 15. It says, 1 Colossians 1 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Right? So he's the firstborn over everything. Now go to 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the, begin who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. See, he's the firstborn. We're the first fruits. And we're his body. We're the first. First resurrection. That's us. That kingdom that comes, that's our house. That's our kingdom. That in all things he may have the preeminence. That kingdom is going to be worldwide. That kingdom is going to be universal. Right now, however, that kingdom is nothing but a little mustard seed, right? It's you and I here in a city of 8 million people. This may be 55, 60 people in the world. If that, probably less. So we know we pray that kingdom come. But we know also that we're in that spiritual kingdom right now. Because we don't belong to the kingdoms down here. Ephesians 2 verse 19 Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and the, with the saints and the members of the household of, household of God. This is a little more personal than just a kingdom. This is a household of God, right? Citizens in that house, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I want to emphasize two words in that frick and in, in that in those sentences, and one is grows, because when that kingdom comes and it smashes that image that we read about in Daniel, that's that image of Nebuchadnezzar as the head of that kingdom, those are kingdoms. Our kingdom smashes that and grows. Right now it's a mustard seed, right? But that's our kingdom. and I'm the, So growth is one. And number two is a dwelling place of God because we're going to see those words again, dwelling place. This is the dwelling place of God that he's talking about. So that rock that comes from heaven smashes that kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar at the top and the Babylonian Empire at the top. And that physical kingdom of God takes over this planet as well. And as I said, the spiritual aspect of that kingdom right now is growing, but it's a mustard seed. Let's turn to that dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Kingdom, one kingdom versus this Babylonian head kingdom. This Babylonian system that's been around since day one. Let's look at Daniel a, a few verses before that in verse 36. This is the dream. We're talking about now that who's the head of the kingdom. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. Here's a fake king of kings, right? Because there's a king of kings there. He controlled all these, all his surroundings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. Even though he was king of kings there, the God of heaven was the one who gave him that power. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men, I want to emphasize that because this is the warfare now. I want, to, I want to see how many times we can identify children of men versus sons of God. Because that's those two kingdoms, there's children of men and there's sons of God. Right here. And wherever the children of men dwell of the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them. You are this head of gold, he's telling King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Those are symbolic, and we'll see that in Revelation. Children of men, we see beasts, and we see foul, unclean birds. That's the kingdom of this world. Those are the kingdoms of this world, okay? And God gives them the foulness. He'll give it to that kingdom. And you want power from that? You'll have that power. But his kingdom is still to come. It, it, it's a little deeper than just the surface of the letter. Focus on that, the children of men. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, of, of Babylon, but it also represented a spiritual system. It had material wealth, it had splendor, it had technological advancement, right? It was a war machine, and it was defiant against God. And you say, well, all, those are all material things. No, those material fleshly things are still spiritual, but they're demonic. They're demonic, even though they are material. There's a battle, spiritual battle. You're either on one side or the other. You have to be aware of that. It was the continuation, actually. This kingdom here is not even the beginning of Babylon. It was a continuation of the system founded by Nimrod. The first fake king of kings. We've talked about this before, right? And where, was, where did he erect his tower? In Babel. Right? Which was the beginning, which was Babylon, later became Babylon. Genesis 10, verse 8. Genesis 10, verse 8. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Symbolically, God does things when he wants people to get together, he gets his shepherds involved. And that, that symbol of a shepherd is how God does his business, not somebody who hunts. So this right now is already telling you his attitude as a leader, what kind of leader he is. He's a hunter, he's not a shepherd. And that before the Lord is more of the tone of in his face, in his face. He wanted to build that tower to be in the face of God. That was that's what the before the Lord is there. And the beginning of his kingdom, read this, Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria, built Nineveh, and it goes on. So look at these, look at these beginning kingdoms. Babel, the, the ba Babylon, the Akkadian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, all these things have their foundation here, right? In this fake king of kings. What do they call this? They call this the cradle of civilization. Don't they call that region the cradle of civilization? Yeah, that's the kingdom. That's this Babylonian system. It's no different. We're still fighting in that area too, right? Aren't we still fighting in that area? Everybody's afraid of, of the end of civilization and they're still fighting around that birthplace there? Genesis 11. Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us build bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. They had asphalt for mortar. See, this was technological advancement for the time. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heaven, right there before the Lord, right in the face of God. And they said, let us make a name for ourselves, not for the glory of God, for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men, there it is, right? The sons of men have built. Are we the sons of men? Or are we past that now, now sons of God? Right? This is a battle. This is a battle of kingdoms. Heads of kingdoms, seeds, we'll get to that in a second. Men are fallen beings, just like fallen angels. Fallen. We're no longer fallen. We've risen up, right? The same as Christ, with Christ. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. As soon as they get together, here's what they started to do. Now they're build, building skyscrapers, right? But if he had let them build skyscrapers, then the time that God allotted for mankind on earth to learn the lesson would have been a whole lot shorter. 
Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Confusion. Babylon. That's what this whole world is. Put it all together into one spiritual kingdom because that's what it is. Right? And from there it's scattered abroad. Now you, we know that every culture eventually comes from this spot right here. Every culture in the world. This was fresh after the flood. Right? We hear flood stories in every... every there's mythologies that the, you know, that folks call it out there, myth, that they hear about flood stories in every single culture because it comes from this. It was fresh in their memories. They understood this. They understood, but they chose to be defiant anyway. This is what they proposed to do, to be before the Lord in his face. The Sabbath. The Sabbath is known all around the world. It came back in the day. They knew it as well, but they had a mix. They, they had technological event. They had knowledge. And they understood the good, right? They, and they understood God and what he did and judgment, right? And they still chose to live the way that they lived. And the garden had two trees and one was pure spirit. One had no shadow of turning. It was all good. That's all God does. The other one had good and evil. Mixing it, mixing it up. Mixing it up. That's why I talk about spiritual warfare, but I throw in Halloween there as well. Mixing it up. And God kicked us out of paradise for mixing it up with evil. And what does he say to the serpent, which is really the head of all disobedience? Genesis 3, verse 14. Genesis 3, verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle. More than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, which is hostility, which is clashing, which is what? Which is war, right? This is war. Kingdoms at war starts here, actually. Even before Nimrod, it goes even back further than Nimrod. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar, it wasn't Nimrod, it goes right here. Between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the dragon wounded Christ, but it wasn't a permanent death blow. A death blow. God flipped it on the devil, and the Passover becomes our salvation. Christ is the seed that will slay the dragon of old. Right? But it starts here. Christ is that seed, right? But there's also, we are also sons of God. We are also in Christ. We are also that seed, and that mustard seed right now. And there's a battle, there's a spiritual war. These are two kingdoms from the very beginning right here. If you don't think so, Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. We'll see that this dragon of old is still around. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's war, it says war. Who keep the commandments of God... And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're not just Christians who profess Jesus Christ, right? And then go around celebrating some pagan Halloween, some nonsense like Halloween. We keep the commandments of God. We keep ourselves clean. Because we know the seriousness of the times. What does Revelation say in Revelation 18 verse 2? Revelation 18 and verse 2. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, a loud voice so people could hear this so, and listen up saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Remember, men are in this fallen condition, right? Men are still in the fallen condition, is fallen. And has become a dwelling place of demons. What did we read? What did we read before? That you're the dwelling place of God. But Babylon, the fallen right here, men. Dwelling place of demons. Sons of the devil, men of his seed, right? Versus the sons of God. A prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Remember those words were also used? 
and that other lot. So this is a contrast. And you can see it here. This is the living word of God. A prison. Christ set us free. Remember Day of Atonement we were talking about? Jubilee, he's here to set us free. This is the dwelling place of demons where people are still caged. The demons caged. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her, of the wrath of her fornication. We drink the wine of the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. We're the virgin bride waiting for his return. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. While we store up treasures in heaven. Right? This is a contrast between the sons of men and the sons of God. This is the war. The kingdoms that are at war. Spiritual warfare. And we want to talk about Halloween. I'm trying to prep, <laughs> pep you up. Pep you up because there's temptation out there to participate in nonsense. And we have to be awake to the fact that there's spiritual war of what side we're on. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, sons of God, right? Sons of God, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven. The tower, right, that reached to heaven, the sins reached to heaven, not the tower. The sins were the ones that reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Let's pray to God that he remembers our faithfulness. That he remembers our faithfulness. Christ makes a clear distinction between the sons of God and the fallen men, sons of the devil, and those who remain in that state. John 8, verse 42. John 8, verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. In case anybody even doubts that Jesus is God. I mean, he says it here, that Jesus never said this or that. Just read the Bible. Don't listen to people who don't read. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Remember the angels saying things in a loud voice of people with ears to hear. You got to listen up. Christians out there, they're too busy yapping away about how they're going to defend something disgusting like Halloween. And they don't want to listen to the word of God. It's okay to dress like an idiot, like a prostitute or a blood sucking ghoul, according to them. <laughs> Verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. In this battle, in this spiritual battle, there's a spiritual battle. There's spiritual death that occurs, and that's permanent if you get caught up in it. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. God doesn't mix it up. His, that fruit of that tree is pure good. It's never mixed with evil. If it's mixed, even a tinge, that's from of the devil. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because, I, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? He's telling them right there. This person is sinless and he knows that Jesus Christ it says, which one of you is going to point the finger at me and tell me I'm a sinner? Mm -hmm. All right? And he says, and so if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, right? Sons of God. Again, I point that out. Therefore... <clears throat> He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, right? Only those who are sons of God, who are born with that same spirit. These are the kingdoms that are at war, brothers. Every battle counts. Every, every battle tests your mettle, your grit, your courage, and your spirit. And you're not just a citizen, you're a soldier. You're a soldier in the spiritual war. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What's that? That's the Holy Spirit. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is war. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Not just the devil, but his demons. Not just the demons, but seeds, physical human beings out there who are manipulated by him. 
seeds all the way down. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You did everything in your power to resist. Don't let it be said that you were lackadaisical about anything. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. And we read this often, breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword, right? We've talked about that, the word of God, praying always, being watchful, persevering. A soldier is alert. A soldier is on time. That's an inside joke to the congregation. A soldier is awake. And we can't take a lackadaisical attitude. You're either on fire for what God has revealed to you, or maybe even you're allowed to, you're in a spiritual warfare and you're down and you're cold. You don't know where you're at. Maybe you're a little lost. But God will work with you. His spirit will hover over you. But don't ever let it be said that you're going to take this for granted and be lackadaisical about it and not understand that you're at war. Romans 13, verse 9. That's the lukewarm, by the way, that I was talking about. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed in the, up in this saying, namely, you shall, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You saw all the knots before, and this one is that you shall. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. This is our weapon. And do this knowing the time. Do you know what time it is? Because most Christians out there don't. That now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Every breath you take, you're closer to judgment. Every breath you take, you're closer. And if it was close for them, imagine us now. We're in the 21st century. 6,000 years is almost past. We're at that very end. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Does that sound like we should put on a costume that reflects darkness and stupidity? I'm not preaching to the church here because you're here on the Sabbath day, but this is going out on video. This is being put out there. Maybe somebody has a question. Maybe somebody's on the fence. Maybe somebody doesn't know that we're at war. Let us, let us walk properly as in the day, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So when people wonder why you're not parading around with, with breasts and butts and butchery with some, as, as some kind of murderer or buffoonery, you tell them when you were in Jesus Christ. That's your costume. You wear it all the time. You don't participate in nonsense. <clears throat> you dress like you're ready to, the, for the return of your master. That's what you're ready for. Look at Luke 12, verse 35. Luke 12, verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. There it is, your... You're dressed and ready, your waist girded, your lamps ready. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. And people say, oh, yeah, are you really a man? You have a master? If you think you don't have a master, you just trick yourself on Halloween, trick or treat. Okay? You think you don't have a master, you have one of two. You either serve one like a man, and that's the creator of the universe who's going to give it all to you. Or you're going to be duped and tricked by the other guy. You yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he, when, and, when, and he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks that he may open for him immediately. Blessed immediately. That's not waiting on anything. You're ready to open that up immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master... Those servants whom the master, remember Jesus said, if my servants were of this world, right? When he comes, we'll find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. That's your master. That's your master. 
And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. Our watch is right now, right? That's our watch. We're on watch. We're on duty. 50, 60 people here, whatever, 7,000, whatever, 12,000, whatever the church of God numbers are. 7,000 back in the day didn't bend the knee, right? Whatever it is now, I'm not bending the knee. There's one who comes in a costume, right? A wolf in sheep's clothing. He also looks like the Lion of Judah sometimes. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I'll leave it with one last verse. Ephesians 5. I think Ephesians was written about Halloween. I don't know. <laughs> Ephesians 5. I kid. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, right? Sons of God. And walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us. And offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Much less be worn as a costume, right? <clears throat> Don't even let it come out of your lips. But so-called Christians, costuming it up, putting the house, look, making it look like a haunted, falling apart place with ghosts. As is fitting for the saints, by the way, is the only thing I'll say about it, because I didn't get into the roots of this holiday, because anybody could Google that nowadays. This goes even deeper. This goes even deeper than that. You'll find how easily you can find how pagan the roots are of that holiday. And it says, as fitting for the saints, the only thing I'll mention here is that the Catholics don't determine who saints are. Okay, God has his book, the book of life. All right? And his instructions on how to be a saint are in that book. And right here, we're following instructions. We're all here on the Sabbath day. We listen to the words in that book, the way Jesus Christ says, and we're sons of God as a result. <clears throat> Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, or trick or treats, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. If we're grateful to God for the things that he's revealed to us, we put all that nonsense behind for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This goes back to kingdom, right? These are kingdom wars. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes about upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't get involved with that. Don't partake of that fruit, right? That's a mix. Of good and evil. Oh, it's just all fun and games. No, it's a mix of stupidity, of evil that you're imitating. I'm an imitator of Christ. I'm from the other tree. The other fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. I have theme music while I'm reading this. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness that goes back to fruit, right? But rather expose them, which is what we're doing. We're exposing it for the stupidity that it is. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Resurrection is beautiful. It's not zombies. Okay, that's what the devil wants you to think. Eternal life is not beautiful. It's not a sad vampire with teeth that is, is upset that he has eternal life. Okay, walk in wisdom, not like an idiot. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine. Remember that? In which is this 
dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's why we're here on time, right? Singing to God. Singing to God. And to each other, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. The only thing to be afraid of, the only thing that's spooky is the unknown about your judgment. God is what you should be frightened of. Not the stupid pagan holiday. If people here have the ears to hear, then we know who they are, right? They're the sons of God. You're the sons of God. You're spiritual soldiers and you're wide awake.